me stop you. Don't let me stop you from making your way to God's throne. I wonder if there's anybody here, if there's anybody watching, who, who knows that, that every now and then we've got to hasten. <laughs> I like the word hasten because it's not saying I, I got to make my way. I, I got to walk one day in the, in the sweet by and by. I, I got to get to God's throne. No, 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 no. Sometimes we find ourselves in situations that are so desperate, so dire, that we can't make our way. We can't take our time. We have to hasten. Oh, y'all don't. Oh, y'all ain't been through. Y'all never been in a desperate, dire situation. Y'all never been so desperate, so out of options, that, that you couldn't wait till Sunday. You couldn't wait to call pastor. You had to hasten to his throne. Yeah, if you've ever been in a situation like that, then you know the significance of those words. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let us hasten to God's word even now. Good morning, Elmwood family. Look at y'all. Look at y'all. Man, man, man. I tell you, I, I, miss, I miss preaching to people and not empty pews. No, no offense, Cor. No, 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 no offense, Cor. Me, me, Cor and I have been holding it down for two years, but it is nice. It is good to see folks in the pews, to see, well, I don't see your faces, I see your masks, but I know you're here, and it feels good. And I'm glad to see your masks, because we're trying to be safe in here, amen? It is good to see you. I do believe that there is a word for the Lord, from the Lord uh, for the people of God. Uh, this is the first, the first Sunday in the month of March. It is her story month, women's history month, and so we are excited. And it is with that backdrop of, of women's history month that leads us to our scripture passage today. Will you stand? From the Gospel of Luke, the eighth chapter, verses one through three, you find these words recorded. Soon afterwards, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Chusa and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. Well, somebody say, it's going to get good today. Let, 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 us, let us pray. Let us pray. God, we are so grateful for this opportunity to worship you and to praise you. We are so grateful for this opportunity to commune with you. Now, God, we get to hear from you, and we are ready. We've been waiting all week. Some of us have been waiting since last Sunday. Some of us have been waiting since Ash Wednesday, but we are so ready to hear a word from you. Speak, God. Your servants are listening. Have your way in this preaching moment. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Soon afterwards, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Johanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Shusa and Susanna, and many others, and I don't want to move too quickly past this last line, and many others who provided for them out of whose resources? Their 
resources. They're always going to be good. Uh, for a subject uh, this morning, I want to preach from the thought, the women behind the movement. The women behind the movement. On November 7th, 2020, Kamala Harris made her story by becoming the first black, the first South Asian, the first woman to become vice president of these United States. In her speech that night, Kamala acknowledged the generations of women who came before her. The women who struggle, whose struggle and sacrifice made it possible for her to stand before us that night as this nation's first woman vice president. Let's take a listen to what she says. And about the generations of women, black women, Asian, white, Latina, Native American women who throughout our nation's history have paved the way for this moment tonight. Women who fought and sacrificed so much for equality and liberty and justice for all, including the black women who are often too often overlooked, but so often prove they are the backbone of our democracy. All the women who have worked to secure and protect the right to vote for over a century, 100 years ago with the 19th Amendment, 55 years ago with the Voting Rights Act, and now in 2020 with a new generation of women in our country who cast their ballots and continued the fight for their fundamental right to vote and be heard. Tonight, I reflect on their struggle, their determination, and the strength of their vision to see what can be unburdened by what has been. And I stand on their shoulders. Amen, amen. In her speech, Kamala recognizes the black women who are so often overlooked but prove time and time again that they are the backbone of our democracy. Here, Kamala is speaking specifically about how black women have shown up and continue to show up politically and particularly for the Democratic Party. In the 2020 election, black women proved to be the Democratic Party's most powerful voting group. According to CNBC, not only did 91% of black women vote for Democratic nominee Joe Biden, but black women were also the driving force behind the election. Women like Stacey Abrams, Latasha Brown, and so many others were on the front lines working to ensure that every eligible voter had their voices heard at the polls. Let me tell you, I felt so proud when I heard Kamala acknowledge on the world stage the contributions of black women. Because the contributions of black women are constantly and consistently dismissed and disregarded. Not only in the political arena, but in other areas of society as well. Even the church. It is no secret that many great churches have been led by men, but they've been built by women. Women have always been and continue to be the backbone of the church. Even when they were not allowed to lead or hold positions of leadership, and even when they weren't recognized for their work, even when they had to watch a man get the credit for the work that they did, women still gave their all to the ministry of the church. Shortly after I was installed as Elmwood's associate 
a pastor for youth and young adults. I remember this day so clearly. It is one that will always stand out in my mind. I remember preaching a sermon one Sunday, and when service was over, I went to greet one of the elders in our congregation, and as I went to give her a hug, I will never, ever, ever forget what she said to me. She said, Pastor Maria, when I was growing up, we didn't have women preachers. I took back my hug, and I was like, okay, where is this going? But she said, back then, People just didn't believe that a woman should preach. She said, but I am so glad that times have changed. Because if women were still not allowed to preach, we wouldn't have you and we wouldn't have your gift. Her comment touched me because I remember being told as a child that women could not be called to preach. Her comment touched me because like Kamala, I understand that as I stand here, I am standing on the shoulders of a long line of women who have come before me. Women like Jarena Lee and Maria Stewart. Women like Julia Foote and Sojourner Truth. Women like my grandmother and my great-grandmother. Women whose names I will never know, but whose contributions to the church have built the foundation that allows me to stand before you today. Women who were not allowed to preach and lead like I can, but they still served the church as deaconesses, missionaries, Sunday school teachers, choir directors, cooks. Listen, can we break down the, the, the cook part? Because whenever the church needed a new roof, a new door, whenever we needed to build a new fellowship hall, get some new chairs, let me tell you, it was the women who would fry the chicken, make the potato salad, and the macaroni and cheese, and they would package these chicken dinners, and they would sell them for $10, and they would collect the money, and they would give it to the church. Somebody just rub your hiney on your pew and say, I'm sitting on this pew because some woman made a chicken dinner. If we really want to get real about it, women have built the church, literally. Literally, it, women kept the church going. When the men didn't know how they were going to raise money, it was the women who baked the pies and, and, and made the cakes. It, it is Women's Herstory Month, isn't it? Women have always been the backbone of the church. And it is time that the church recognizes the contributions of women and so I'm calling out the church not just Elmwood but I'm calling out every church it is time to acknowledge the women who for years never got the credit whose faces were never on the wall of pastors you ever go into a church and you see all the pastors faces on the wall you don't ever see the women who were behind the scenes raising the money Teaching the classes, leading the choirs. It's time for the church to make some things right. But I digress. Politics and the church are not the only places where the contributions of women are often overlooked. Even in history, Anita Mack, because you're a history teacher, you know this, even in history, women's contributions are often minimized and, and overlooked. During the civil rights movement, women like Ella Baker and Fannie Lou Hamer risked their lives and worked tirelessly to end segregation. But their work and their contributions are often overshadowed by Dr. King and other male leaders. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, um, today we, we celebrate the anniversary of Bloody Sunday of 1965. You all remember March 7th. It is the 7th, isn't it? Yeah, 
March 7th, 1965, a then 25-year-old John Lewis led over 600 marchers across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. This was a peaceful protest, but, but they were brutally attacked by state troopers. And let me tell you, when the state troopers began hitting them with clubs and batons, they didn't just hit the men. Women got hurt that day. Women shed blood that day. Women were also injured on that day. Women worked just as hard, and they worked alongside our brothers during the civil rights movement, but none of them get the credit or the acknowledgement for their contributions. We've all heard of the Montgomery bus boycott, but what we haven't always heard is that it was the women who kept that movement going. The women arranged carpools and organized alternate transportation. The women baked the cakes and, and sold the pies to raise money for the boycott, it was the women who were the driving force behind that movement, not only to mention it was a woman who started it, Rosa Parks. And, and, and listen, I, I know, listen, 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 I just recently found out, this is recent news to me, that, the, um, that, that there were women behind Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Um, um, I brought proof, too, because um, sometimes, you, you know, just, yeah. so, so, so there are two books if you want to fact check my sermon today. The first is um, The Montgomery Bus Boycott and the Women Who Started It, right? So you get that book from Amazon. But the book I want to reference right now is The Black Church. This is our story. This is our song by Henry Louis Gates. And let me give you the page number just so you can, all right? On page 138 through 139. Only because somebody's going to be upset. Because I am in no way trying to tear down Dr. King's legacy. But I do think that it is important during Women's History Month that we give her credit for where credit is due. And right now there are two women who were the driving force behind that speech. Listen. Listen, get the book. But this is what what's, um, uh, Dr. Gates quotes Reverend Senator Raphael Warnock. And listen to what Senator Raphael Warnock, who is the uh, pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church in, in Atlanta, Georgia. Listen to what he says. Reverend Prathia Hall was one of the many women who has not gotten her just due. In fact, Martin Luther King Jr., was a part of a mass meeting one day here in rural Georgia. And while he was in that mass meeting, Reverend Prathia Hall began to talk to God aloud about what her desire was for the world. And over and over again, Reverend Prathia Hall kept saying to God, I have a dream, I have a dream, I have a dream. Uh, uh, Senator Warnock goes on to say those words that Martin Luther King had immortalized that were inextricably tied to his legacy had an origin of their own. People need to know that before it was Martin's dream, it was Prathia's prayer. <laughs> Page 138. Now, to be fair, the content of the speech was all king. But the refrain, you know, the most famous part was Prathia Halls. And then, and then, because that's one woman, and then when Dr. King was delivering his speech at the March on Washington in 1963, he had a completely different speech prepared. But as he was uh, 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 giving his prepared speech, it just wasn't hitting. It, it just wasn't connecting with the people. And so from the sidelines, that bad mama Gemma named Mahalia Jackson 
she was able to discern that this speech it just wasn't connecting with the people and so from the side from the side from the side Mahalia Jackson yelled out to King tell him about the dream Martin tell him about the dream and when King heard Mahalia telling him to tell them about the dream King shifted his speech and he started to tell the people I have a dream I have a dream yeah it was a woman from the sidelines who pushed King into stepping into his destiny I have a dream is regarded as one of the world's most transformative and influential speeches of all time. And to think it almost didn't happen. But thank God for the women. Politics, the church, history, these are not the only places where women have been overlooked. Even on the pages of scripture, the contributions of women are not always recognized. We all know the names of Jesus' prominent male followers. We know the name Peter. We know the name Thomas. We know the name John. Shoot, we even know the name Judas. But when it comes to the women in Jesus' circle, their names are not always recorded. As a matter of fact, many of them are identified in scripture by their issues. The woman with the issue of blood, like she didn't have a name. The woman caught in adultery. The woman at the well who had five husbands and the one she was with was not her husband. The woman with the alabaster box, who was known as a sinner in that town. These are how the women in Jesus' circle are described. And let me tell you, I don't know, and, and, I've, and I've read a lot of the Bible, I've, I've read a lot of the Bible, but I don't know any male in scripture who is described as a sinner in that town. And you can't tell me that the brothers weren't sinning too. Shoot, who was she sinning with? Y'all, listen, I made history here at Elmwood. I don't I don't want to make history by being the first pastor put out. So let me let me hasten. <laughs> let me hasten to my point. <laughs> are going to put me out. But, but I mean, seriously, have we ever asked these questions? And for those of you who are sitting and struggling with the fact that I'm, I'm raising questions about the Bible, I'm not challenging the Bible, but I'm reading the Bible critically and there's a difference. It is okay to raise questions about the Bible. Why is it that every male follower of Jesus has a name and when it comes to the women, they are identified by their sin, by their issues, by their problems. Why is that? If we can answer that question, we can fully understand the context that Jesus was in and it might help us to understand Jesus a little bit better. Even on the pages of scripture, the contributions of women have been dismissed, denied, disregarded, and overlooked. This is why when I read our scripture passage this morning, my soul opened up because this passage is one of the few passages in scripture that recognizes the role women played in the Jesus movement. This scripture also proves that Jesus did not see or treat women the same way society does. When society dismisses us, denies us, disregards us, Jesus validates us. Jesus affirms us. Jesus elevates us. How many of you know that's good news this morning? 
many of you know that's good news, not just for women, but for anyone who has ever been dismissed, denied, disregarded, and overlooked? Jesus does not see us the same way society sees us, and that's good news. When society overlooks us, Jesus affirms us. That's good news, not just for the women, but it's good news for black folks. It's good news for Spanish folks. It's good news for the LGBTQIA community. It's good news for Asians. It's good news for Ukraine. It's good news for the less, the lost, the left out, and the least of these. It's good news. See, see, when you understand the context, then you can get excited about the ministry of Jesus because without understanding how the context dismissed women, you don't see the value in Jesus raising them up. That's why we ask questions of the text. It helps us to understand Jesus and God just a little bit better. Jesus does not see us the same way society sees us in our text. Our text is all the proof we need. Let's jump into this text. The scripture opens with, soon afterwards, he went on through cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Let's stop right here, because this right here is interesting to me. Um, I know I'm a pastor and I get excited about this stuff, but you all should get excited too. This is some interesting stuff because we know that Jesus was an itinerant preacher. We know that Jesus traveled to different cities and villages and homes proclaiming the good news. And it is a known fact that the 12 were always with him. Except for when they weren't, um, except for when they were going to the store. Right, right, right. So, so, but they were always with him. Right? Um. But what isn't a well-known fact is that the 12 were always with him, but, but, but women were with him too. That that's not always expressed or understood. That, that, that it wasn't just Jesus and the 12. It was Jesus, the 12, and some women. That, that, that changes. That changes how we view everything, even the Lord's Supper. When, 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 they, when they describe how Jesus' followers were, were in the upper room, who were they talking about? Now, the pictures depict Jesus and the 12, but now after reading this, I have to wonder, what about the women who were also with him? I mean, this is why we challenge the text. This is why we question the text, right? Right? Are y'all having any aha moments? Damn. Right? So, so every time... Um, um, we read about a woman. We read about her in the context of what Jesus has done for her. Right? The woman, the woman caught in adultery, what does Jesus do? Jesus steps in and advocates for her. The woman with the issue of blood, Jesus steps in, restores her. The woman at the well, what does Jesus do? Jesus engages her. Every time we read about a woman, it's always in the context of what Jesus did for her. We rarely get the opportunity to read about all of the things that women were doing for Jesus. Our text this morning provides one of those rare moments where we get to see women as more than recipients of Jesus' ministry. We get to see them as, as more than recipients. We get to see that just like the 12, these women were followers, supporters, partners, co-laborers with Jesus in ministry. Y'all, these were not Jesus groupies. These were not Jesus groupies. These women had something to offer. Each of them used their gifts and their time and their resources. These were the women behind the movement. Let's break them down. The first woman was Mary. The text tells us that Mary was delivered from seven 
demons and Jesus delivered her. And after he delivered her, she was never the same again. Mary had a story. And that story was about how Jesus delivered her from demoniac to disciple. And Mary was so grateful that she dedicated her life to following Jesus. Everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Because everywhere that Mary went, she was sure to tell her story. In every city, she would tell her story. In every village, she would tell her story. The gift Jesus gave Mary was deliverance. And the gift Mary gave Jesus was telling her story. Do we have any women in the house today? Do we have any women watching the broadcast today who can say, I have a story? Any woman listening to this sermon who can say, you may look at me in all my glory, but you don't know me because you don't know my story. You don't know about my demons. You don't know how Jesus delivered me. You don't know where I've been. You don't know where I came from. You don't know what I had to overcome to get here. You don't know my story. Yeah, I'm following Jesus now. Jesus is my homeboy now, but you don't know what he delivered me from. You don't know the demons I was fighting. You don't know how hard I prayed, how long I waited. You don't know my story. We, 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 we all had some demons that we had to fight. We've all had to deal with some stuff that threatened to keep us from becoming the women God was calling us to be. But like Mary, we've got to tell our story in every city, in every village, on our jobs, in our families, at the barbecue. We've got to tell our story because someone needs to know, someone needs to hear that if Jesus delivered me, in all my demons, then certainly Jesus can deliver them too. Do I have any women in the house who can say, I'm going to tell my story? We also have to tell our story because if we don't tell our story, somebody else will and they'll put their spin on it. We may show up in his story and not have any names. Okay, y'all went over it. Um, if we don't tell our story, we're going to end up in his story and we won't have any names. Okay, okay. Should I push it or should I not? Push it? Okay. I'm just, I'm just wondering and wonder along with me. What if the woman at the well wrote her own story. And it was right there alongside of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the woman at the well. You know, I don't even like calling her the woman at the well. Can we call her Keisha? Yeah. All right, let's call her Keisha, because I want to give her a name. She deserves a name. For all that she has done in Christendom, she deserves a name, Keisha. So what if we had Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Keisha? Okay, listen, I'm trying to keep my job. Let me just hasten on to the... <laughs> Pastor's over here questioning the Bible. Now she's trying to put uh, uh, buy books in the Bible. I know, I know, I know. We got to tell our story. Because if we don't, we'll end up in his story with no names. There are women who followed Jesus. And they've got a story. But the text doesn't just mention Mary. The text also mentions a woman by the name of Joanna. Isn't it cool that Joanna's here today? Yeah. yeah. In the house. In the house. So let me tell you about Joanna. Joanna was the wife of Herod's steward, Shusa. 
Now, this description doesn't tell us anything about Joanna. It doesn't tell us who she is or, or where she's from or how she uh, came to be associated with Jesus. The only thing this description tells us is that she is the wife of a high-ranking official in Herod's court. Now, Luke may have described her this way because he may have wanted to emphasize the fact that Joanna brought economic wealth, political importance, and social standing to the Jesus movement, all because of who she was married to. Okay? So, 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 so these women brought some stuff. These weren't women, these weren't groupies. They weren't just following Jesus. They brought some stuff. Right? And, and Joanna brought economic wealth, political importance, and social standing to the Jesus movement because of who she was married to. Now, during this time, women didn't have an identity apart from their husbands. But I believe that Jesus gave Joanna's life meaning and purpose beyond being someone's wife. So maybe that's the reason Joanna gives so much of her time to the ministry. Maybe she really appreciated having her own identity. But also, listen to this. If Joanna, listen, was following Jesus, it meant that she had to leave her husband, her family, her children. And this would have been a major sacrifice for a woman in that day. Now listen, no one blinked when men left their homes, their wives, their children, their jobs, their responsibilities to follow Jesus. No one blinked when, when John and Peter uh, left their lives to follow Jesus. But a woman, all right, a woman leaving her husband to follow another man? This don't look good. But let me tell you, for me, Joanna represents the countless number of women who give so much to the ministry while also trying to jungle the demands of families and jobs. These women have husbands, they have children, they have families that need, to, that need to be cared for. They have homes that they have to maintain, meals they have to cook. But these women find a way to balance all of their responsibilities while also supporting the ministry because they believe in the vision and mission of Jesus. Am I right, Gia? We all know a woman who goes above and beyond, who gives to the church, who loves the Lord, who presses her way out while also trying to balance the demands of life. Joanna brought status to the ministry, but she also had to make some sacrifices to be there. We thank God for all of the women who handle that and handle it so well. They, they, they balance life while also still making sure that they serve God and serve the church. So far behind the, the, the Jesus movement, uh, there are, there's Mary who had a story, Joanna who had status and made some sacrifices, and the last woman who was named in our text as Susanna. But the text doesn't say anything about her. We know Mary had a story, we know Joanna had status, but what did Susanna have? The text says nothing about her. Who is she? Where was she from? Was she married? We have no idea. And for me, Susanna represents all of the women whose names we'll never know, whose faces will never get recognized, whose stories will never be told, but their contributions to the ministry are undeniable. These are the women who come to church Sunday after Sunday. They don't have a story like Mary, they don't have status like Joanna, but they're faithful. These faithful women have been the best supporters of the church. They don't have a story. They don't have status, but they show up. They're at church every Sunday, 
virtual or in person. They're not picky and they don't complain. They just go with the flow and I appreciate you so much. They're on the prayer call every morning. They're at Bible study on Wednesday, prayer meetings on Saturday. They support the youth. They make their way to the Christmas concert because they want to be there for their church. Whatever program past the plans, even if it's out the box, they still show up. We worshiping in the park during COVID? Okay, I'll come. If we need someone to bake a cake for the church barbecue, they always say yes because the Susannas of the church always show up. I'm so grateful for the Susannas who show up, who are consistent in their support. Mary, Joanna, Susanna, these were just three of the women who gave their time, their money, and their resources to the ministry of Jesus. Just three. The text tells us that there were many others. These women were the backbone of the Jesus movement, and we have to be very, very careful because sometimes backbone can be interpreted as background. But the text is clear. These women were not in the background. They were a visible and a vital force within Jesus' ministry. They were so visible, so vital, that even Jesus called the 12 men to be, to be disciples. But it was the women who followed him all the way to the end. While the men disassociated themselves for Jesus at the end, while the men were hiding in secret quarters, it was the women who gathered at the foot of the cross. It was the women who prayed for Jesus when he couldn't pray for himself. It was the women who gave him strength during his final hour. It was the women, and I wonder on this first Sunday of Herstory Month, if we can just take a moment to thank God for the women behind the movement. In her speech, Ain't I a Woman, women's rights activist, abolitionist, Isabella Baumfree, better known to all of us as Sojourner Truth. Here is what she says about the relationship between Christ and women. She says, That man back there, he says that women should not have as much rights as a man because Christ wasn't a woman. Well, I want to know, where did his Christ come from? Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man ain't had nothing to do with him. Now, if the first woman that God ever created was a strong enough to turn this whole world upside down all by herself. Then all these women here put together should be able to turn it right side up again. And you men better.
better let him do it. Obliged to y'all for hearing me, but old Sojourner ain't got nothing more to say.